Good morning. Uh, I'm Chris Sullivan. I'm the Groups and Next Steps pastor here at STF. It is a privilege uh, to be with you and to open up God's Word. Um, I've lived in Tampa almost my entire life. Uh, I'm one of those rare people that were born and raised here, and I'm still here. Uh, I was uh, going to Bucks games when the creamsicle uniforms weren't throwbacks, and uh, when they called the stadium the Big Sombrero. Thank you, Chris Berman. Uh, and when you live in Florida your entire life, hurricanes are just kind of like part of the deal. Uh, it's something that uh, we've become used to, uh, maybe even some of us had become comfortable with. And if you know me, you know uh, my personality. I don't get too high or too low. Uh, I'm going to roll with the punches, like whatever comes, like I, I'm going to be all right. And so I was feeling last week as Milton approached, I was feeling like relatively comfortable, Right, And then there's this moment where um, Greg D., who's one of the, the meteorologists at ABC, comes on. He's showing the track, and he's like, look, here's the track, and it's going south of the bay. And it's just like, for it to keep this track, it's going to have to make a right turn, and that's not going to happen. And something in me just kind of like dropped. But then I was like, hell, this is like the other meteorologist. Like, what's Dennis going to say? Uh, and Dennis is like... And Dennis is like, I, I, I mean, I, I think the same. Like, there's no way this thing makes a right turn. And praise God it did. But in that moment, it was just so clear to me how powerless I was to do anything about it. From the East Coast, where we'd uh, seen tornadoes and damage over there already, that I was just, all I could do was sit there and, and watch. But I had power to do nothing and I just asked this morning, have you ever felt powerless? Maybe it was um, the week before uh, with Helene, or maybe it was in the midst of Milton. You just felt this sense of, I'm powerless in the face of a storm, in the face of uh, this incredible nature. Like, what can I do? And maybe it's not a storm that made you feel powerless. Maybe uh, it's an illness um, that you've battled for years or watching a loved one struggle with an illness. Maybe uh, it's watching one of your children uh, make decisions that, that you know are not what's best for them. Maybe it's struggling with mental illness or addiction or a child who's wandered. We all have these moments in life where it's just so clear that, that we're powerless. There's nothing that we can do to change them. And in all of these moments, we're reminded of something that's always been true. We live with an illusion of control, but we're powerless. And I think most of us, I I know, speaking for myself, I do everything I can to avoid those moments. At all costs, I want to avoid that moment because I don't like that feeling. I want to be in control. But here's what I believe. I believe that these moments where the illusion of control is removed and our powerlessness is exposed, I believe that they're an incredible opportunity. Because as long as we feel like we have control, as long as we feel like we have power, our pride keeps us from going to Jesus. And when life makes us feel small, we have a great God for whom every problem is small, and he's just been waiting for us to stop trying to do things on our own and come to him. This morning, we just saw a story of a man who... He's got a lot of power. He's a Roman centurion. And yet he reaches this moment in his life where he goes, I am powerless to do anything about the problem in front of me. Life dealt him a hand that he couldn't overcome. And in his powerlessness, he turns to Jesus, who is both powerful and willing to help. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we just thank you for your goodness, Lord. We thank you um, for just these pictures that we get to see in your word of your authority and your goodness, Lord, that you are able and you are willing. And so, Father, I just pray um, that we would not miss this opportunity to repent of our pride, our control, our sin, and and turn to you, to, to just see that there are areas in our lives where we're still hanging on, these places where we're still trying to, um, Find stability by, in our illusion of control. Lord, I pray that you would just reveal those today and lead us to surrender them to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. If you take out or turn on your Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 5. Uh, so Matthew 8, verse 5. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. Uh, and so centurions were in charge of 80 to 100 men. It was the smallest unit in the Roman army. And centurions were non-commissioned officers who had worked their way up through the ranks. So this isn't somebody who was appointed. He wasn't born into something and somebody gave him something. This is a talented, competent, skilled leader of men. And this guy in this moment is desperate. He has a problem that he can't solve. And there's a number of surprising things about this situation. First, he calls Jesus Lord. And you saw the surprise in the video. And at a minimum, this use of the word Lord indicates that the centurion is not approaching Jesus in power. He's not approaching him in authority. Even though he has the full backing of Caesar and the Roman military, he's not coming to him going, I have authority, help me. He's not even coming as a peer and going, hey, like we're kind of equals. He is putting himself under Jesus and going, hey, you are an authority that I don't have, I don't know, and I need help. He's desperate. And I, I love that we sang uh, that song this morning, Lord, I'm desperate for you. I'm desperate for you. And that's where this guy is. And in that desperation, he finds Jesus. So despite his position, despite his skill and wisdom, he comes to Jesus. And he comes recognizing that Jesus has greater authority than he does. Second, the reason he's approaching Jesus is because his servant needs help. Now, Romans did not have a high view of their servants. One commentator wrote, the centurion's attitude of love and concern was quite unusual. For under Roman law, a slave was defined as a living tool who had no rights. In fact, the master could abuse him and even kill him if he chose to do so. Uh, a Roman writer on estate management recommended the farmer to examine his implements every year and to throw out those which were old and broken and to do the same with his own slaves. And so this guy's love and concern for his servant is totally out of context and out of character. But this man cares for his servant enough to seek out help. And in this word that we read in verse 5, he's appealing to Jesus. This is an emotional appeal. One translation says he's pleading with Jesus. So this Roman centurion moved with compassion and aware of his own inability to do anything but find help seeks out Jesus. And without hesitation, Jesus responds. He, and he said to him, I will come and heal him. It doesn't matter that he's a Gentile. It doesn't matter that he's a Roman soldier who they would have been viewed by the Jews as, hey, they're the occupying authority. We don't want to, to play nice with them. Jesus doesn't care about anybody. He says, I will come. Somebody's come and asked me for help. I'm, I'm willing to go and heal him. Because anyone can come to Jesus. Guys, anyone can come to Jesus. And at the beginning of the chapter, the beginning of chapter 8, Jesus heals a leper who would have been an outcast from Jewish society. He would have been unclean, unable to go to worship, unable to enter the temple. And Jesus heals him. And then he meets with this Roman soldier. Then in the next section, he's going to heal Peter's mother who's sick with a fever. Male and female, Jew and Gentile, it doesn't matter. Anyone can come to Jesus with a request. And that's what you see all throughout the Gospels. Tax collectors, prostitutes, criminals, religious leaders, it doesn't matter. Anyone can come to Jesus with any problem. And so Matthew chapter 8 is all about Jesus' authority. Because at the end, uh, if you go back and look at Matthew, there's a couple of chapters before this, and it's all Jesus teaching. It's all Jesus talking. And what the crowds see after his sermon, and then when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority, and not as their scribes. He was teaching with authority, not about authority. And so Matthew chapter 8 is all this picture of, hey, Everyone's going, wow, Jesus has this authority. He teaches with this authority we've never seen before. In Matthew 8, Matthew goes, look, this is what that authority looks like in real life. And so Jesus begins healing, and he heals a leper, and then he heals a paralytic. Um, 
and he's going to do it no look long distance, right? Like he's going to heal him. He's not going to see him. He's not going to touch him. No look long distance healing, right? So we have a leper, a paralytic. He's going to heal a fever because Jesus has authority over sickness. And we see in Matthew 8, 16, it says, That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. The thing I love about this verse is it's almost like a throwaway comment. Matthew's like, oh, they brought him everyone who was possessed by a demon, and he fixed it. He cast it out. No big deal. Because Jesus has authority over sickness. He has authority over spiritual forces. And then Jesus is going to calm a violent storm that's terrified seasoned fishermen because Jesus has authority over nature. Anyone can come to Jesus with any problem because he has authority over everything. And this is what we learn in Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has authority. He has power over everything everywhere. There's no problem too big, but y'all, there's no problem too small. He's not a specialist. He deals with certain types of problems. He can deal with any sort of problem. He's never too busy. You don't need an appointment to reach him. Uh, maybe many of you have had the experience this month of like trying to get somebody to come out and look at a roof uh, or fix a fence, and it's like you can't even get a call back, Right? much less get somebody out to look at it. And Jesus, he's willing, he's able, and he is available. And the centurion, the centurion gets this. Look what he says. He says, only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. The centurion says, I understand how authority works because I have men under my command. And when I say it, they do it. And I don't know how the centurion understands that Jesus has authority that he's never seen before, authority over everything. But he realizes this truth that Jesus can speak and even creation obeys. And he's, there's this truth This reality that if we go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And how did he do that? He spoke. He said a word. And God said in Genesis 1-3, let there be light. And there was light. God said, God speaks. And the oceans are formed. God speaks and plants arise from the ground. God speaks and the sun and the moon and the stars are hung in the sky. The God who created the universe, who spoke it into existence with just a word, is the same God that he had access to and, y'all, that you have access to. He's available to you. He loves you. Let that sink in for a moment. The God that made everything wants you to know him. He wants you to ask him for help. You are not inconveniencing him. You aren't bothering him when you ask. He wants you to ask. He's not saying, oh, here's Chris again. What does he want now? He already knows what I need. And here's what we have to understand. God isn't like us. His time and his resources are unlimited. All right? So you have a neighbor comes by. Like, they want you to buy a plant coupon, plant football coupon card, right? Or maybe whatever candy bars or whatever they're selling, the first one comes, and you're like, yeah, 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 I'll help. And the second one comes, and you're like, all right, like, all right. Like, I, I guess. The third one comes, you turn the lights off, like, it, nobody's home, right? <laughs> you're like, no, I've done enough. God's not like that. He invites us to come to him. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He invites you to come and rest. And I know after the month that we've had, we could all use some rest. But there's a problem. For whatever reason, we like to hold on to some of our burdens. Uh, It's been said that change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. Uh, And I'll tell you, like, I know that so often we're like, it's not, like, it doesn't hurt enough for me to go to the doctor. 
right? Like my wife's been trying to get me to go to the dentist for years, and I'm like, it doesn't hurt enough, right? And here's the thing, but, but why would I want to get to the point where it does, right? And by the time I get there, it's going to be a bigger problem, and I'm going to be worse off than if I had just dealt with it in the first place. And so God doesn't want us to go through all of that pain that we have to learn the lesson the hard way and we have to come to him. But so often we choose to stay away, to deal with things on our own. Anyone can come to Jesus, but some won't. In Matthew 8, 10, it says, When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the problem isn't that Jesus is not powerful enough to handle our problems. The problem isn't that Jesus isn't willing to handle our problems. Jesus is willing and able. And yet we read that some are going to come and experience all the goodness that God has to offer at a banquet in heaven. But others are going to be thrown out. And there's a terrible reality that awaits them. And what's the difference? Let's look at the centurion. His view of God is big. He goes, Jesus, just say the word. I understand that you have power. You have authority. You're big. And his view of his self, his authority, his ability, and he has some. He goes, that, that's small. His view of self is small. In 8.8, he says, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Guys, but he asks anyway, right? Our unworthiness is not an obstacle for Jesus. Our pride is. Our unwillingness to ask is. Because anyone who comes to Jesus must come in humility, our world tells us to know our worth. And we should know, right? We should know that every human is valuable because they're made by God in his image. But the centurion's example is the exact opposite of telling the world what it owes you and not settling for less. He's a picture of something that's taught all over the scripture from beginning to end. In Matthew 23, he says, whoever exalt himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Proverbs 29 says, one's pride will bring him low. But he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. James 4, 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So we don't have any basis to come to God except for his grace and his mercy. Now, in Luke's account of the story, there's something really interesting that happens. He tells some religious leaders uh, there's some religious leaders that come to Jesus to vouch for the centurion. And in Luke 7, verse 4, it says, And they came to Jesus, and they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him. He loves our nation. He's the one who built us our synagogue. And they start listing off his resume. He's a friend to our people. He loves our nation. He loves our people. He built us a synagogue. But guys, there's no resume that puts God into our debt. And I lived that way trying to go, God, you, you owe me. God, look, everybody's doing this, and I'm over here doing this. Like, you should, like, come on, God. It, it doesn't work that way. He created us. He gave us breath and life and every good thing. That's what we sang this morning. It's all his. We don't have anything to give him or offer him except what he's given us. And he desires for us to come to him, but we must come with our need, our helplessness, not with our strength and our resume. And the, un and the centurion understood this. They go, he's worthy. And he goes, I'm not worthy. Like, he goes, no, absolutely not. I'm not worthy, but you, Jesus, are able. Just speak a word and my servants Will be healed. The centurion's view of God is big and his view of self is small. And the Bible says that Jesus marveled at his faith. And so how do we cultivate an attitude of humility? Not a woe is me, I'm the worst, because every person has value and dignity because they're made in the image of God. But humility is the recognition that in the presence of God, we have no, we have no standing except Jesus. We have no strength or gift to give 
accept what we've been given. And if we were to know our worth and said, we said to God, give me what I deserve. Give me what I deserve. The bad news is that what we deserve is hell and separation from God. The God who loves us and made us to delight in his presence. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. What that means is what our payment is, like what we deserve for our work is death and separation from God. But the gift, the free gift, right? So Jesus is able, he's available, and the price is right, y'all. It's free. It's offered to us. But we have to get out of our own way and receive it and accept it. And so if you say, give me what I deserve, you get it, and it's not what you want. But if we say, I don't deserve anything, but help me, we get everything. We get everything. And so Jesus offers us life based on God's grace and mercy, a free gift that no one can earn. So not only is Jesus willing and able, but the price is right. And so I would just ask you today, is there a time where you've ever done that, where you've ever come to him and said, Jesus, I, I can't. I've tried to control my own life. I've tried to do things my own way, and it's time to surrender my life to you. I'm going to stop trusting me. I'm going to stop trusting my resume or my performance, and I'm just going to trust in you today. Uh, we have a, a program here at the church called Celebrate Recovery, and uh, the first three principles in that, I think, like, are this message in a nutshell. Uh, step one is realize I'm not God, right, which sounds obvious, right? But when we take control, we're going, hey, I'm kind of God. It's, I realize I'm not God. Admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Step two, earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and that he has the power to help me recover. And third, constantly choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. We realize that, that we're small. We realize that God is big and he's willing and able. And we take that step of surrender. And we offer our lives to him. Our imperfect, not put together, messy, like, um, you know, it was, it was interesting, uh, like in South Tampa, um, we can do the like white picket fence, like Christmas card, everybody's happy, everything's perfect thing. Uh, and it just occurred to me as uh, we were helping friends take everything out of their houses a couple of weeks ago. It's like everything that was inside was brought outside for all to see. And if God took everything that was inside us and put it on outside for the world to see, like that's, I, I, that's my worst nightmare. Is that your worst nightmare? Like everybody just... But the beautiful thing is that that Jesus sees that. He knows that. He has that. And he still says, come to me. He still says, he, he knows the mess, right? He knows all of it. He goes, come. Come and find rest. So I just want to give us a moment, um, a moment to reflect, a moment to, to just, just think, um, hey, are there any areas of our lives where we're holding on to control? Like, are there any areas of our lives where I'm finding hope in this moment right now, even in my powerlessness, where I'm going, I can, I can control this, right? Like, we start to find these little things that we can do, and we know that it's one plus one equals two, and I don't have to worry about it. I can't fail. And so where are those places you're looking right now for hope? And what does it look like to surrender? I'm going to read um, I want to read to you guys from uh, Isaiah chapter 6, and we'll close. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. You know what this picture is telling us? It's just telling us that God is great. That God is incomprehensibly large. Amazing. And look at Isaiah's response to that. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He goes, woe is me. He goes, when I come into the presence of God, I see that he is big, and I see everything. All of me that's inside is right outside. I am exposed. And he goes, woe is me. Because what should happen is that we should be condemned, right, and and yet we're not, right? He sees God as big. He sees he is small. But God takes action, right? God takes action to deal with his sin, sin and to cleanse him. It says, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And that's what happened with Jesus. God sent his son to do what we could not do, to take the punishment that we deserve so that we could live and have eternal life. Hey, if you guys would just bow your heads and, and close your eyes. Um, I just want you to, to get, take a moment to think and reflect. Hey, is there, is there something I'm holding on to? Is there, is there some place I'm looking for comfort, for authority, looking for for hope that's not Jesus? Is it my finances or my parenting or my work? Or like, what are those places where I'm going, hey, I've got this. This area, like everything, the rest of my life is spinning out of control, but I can control this. And I just want you to take a moment. I'll be silent for a second and just give you a minute to, to surrender that to God. And I want to ask you, what, is, what would surrender look like for you today? If you were going to give up control of that one thing, what is one step, one action that you could take to go, this isn't mine anymore? Maybe it's something to do. Maybe it's something not to do. But what does obedience look like today? Just take a moment and reflect. Father, I just thank you that when we are exposed, that when we are laid bare, you don't turn your back on us. Knowing everything, you sent Jesus because of our mess to deal with it. Lord, and I pray today that we would not go back to normal, that we would seize this opportunity in front of us where we have been laid bare, where we have seen our powerlessness, the illusion of control has been removed. Father, I pray that you would just use this moment to transform us so that you can send us because we live in a world that needs hope and light right now. And so, Lord, we just surrender. Uh, we submit and we say, please, Lord, send us.